Да. С вашего позволения. With your permission, I will speak in Russian as well, because it might be difficult to translate from English into Russian, then back into English, and then into Russian. And sometimes there are even Russian texts which were originally translated into English and then into Russian. So it will be too complex. So I will speak Russian, but I will think in the meantime about being interpreted into English. So our presentation is called uh, core measurement, which means coordinated measurement. As uh, the spine or the basis of uh, arithmetic curriculum. I represent a group of researchers here, and uh, Yelena Vysotska is also part of that group, as well as uh, Maria Yandyshevska, and we also have Ilya Rahman in our group. He is based in the United States. Today we are going to talk about a ratio. Everyone is familiar with this notion in physics, in chemistry. This is also the notion of buoyancy, concentration, and other things. Uh, we can see it in maths. There are sines, uh, cosines, uh, the, for instance, the notion of uh, percent, uh, all those proportions and fractions that we come across uh, in the fifth or sixth grade. There are also fractions uh, and also those things that we see in our everyday life, such as uh, loans, prices, discounts. And uh, there is the ratio as uh, a concept which is the basis of all those things. Uh, there's a special ratio and a proportion. And uh, with all those notions, uh, all students of uh, all ages are facing a lot of challenges. There are internet memes about humanitarians, but everything, everyone faces those problems. Even Piaget wrote about those problems. Uh, there's also a problem that uh, the proportion between uh, magnitudes uh, is changed. So a lot of problems uh, are faced. Uh, there are problems that uh, students face in chemistry and in physics. There are problems uh, in math lessons in the fifth and sixth grade. Uh, with multiplication and division of uh, fractions. I'm not talking about uh, Jacob's uh, students. I'm talking about the ordinary students, not the immortals. And uh, we are going to try to approach those issues uh, from the point of view of psychology. And as psychologists, uh, we are going to try to review the content, the very content of mathematical teaching. Why is it up to psychologists to do? We are based on the position of activity psychology, and we have those four columns, uh, the theory of by Vygotsky, the theory of um, and Galperin. There's a difficult uh, word combination, but very difficult for interpreting into English. And unfortunately, our screen is off, and we also have the theory of uh, developing learning by Mr. Davidov. Well, I don't know how to relaunch that screen. Well, look at me. It's like in the classroom, all eyes on me, please. Now, the psychologist's work is to analyze children's actions. What do children do when they learn? And uh, what's the basis uh, for their next actions or activities? Can we actually switch this screen on, please? There's the next slide. It's not so important, but anyway, it's not for one year, it's more than for one year that we've been doing this. Uh, we've been working on this ratio concept. And uh, during all the previous work, we have been thinking about how to form those notions among children. We believe that uh, we use the core measurement action as the basis for understanding a ratio, which uh, is an action 
done by two children. Each child is responsible for one value. And as uh, these uh, values change, uh, this action between children is the basis for understanding proportion. And as the compound uh, measure, which is uh, measured by the two values, uh, this is the action which is uh, mediated by their actions. Uh, and it's also the basis of uh, their understanding of this notion. And finally, there is a third important thing. When we talk about the child needing to do this, we don't say that the child has to invent this action by himself or herself. What we say is that the child should reconstruct certain cultural activity that happened in humankind's history to move on to those notions. That means that we need to find uh, a similar situation, a situation of concept origin in English. That's why we choose specific cultural contexts. For example, there's the Boyne's context. We control how vessels are balanced in water, or there is this mixture of paints to understand uh, the notion of concentration. And uh, those courses have been tested, and we've shown the efficiency of such an approach uh, for secondary school, for high school. So when these things are done in pairs, there is distributed action, this really works. So this is what I've been talking about. This is a distributed action between two children on the top. There is uh, a stripe of lens, and uh, there is another person, and uh, their work is the coordinated change of one value with their coordinated change in the value of uh, in the second value, and this is what we do next to make sure that one person can do all that, uh, so that this action done by the two is. Uh, mm, done by one person after that. Intervent try, if I'm not mistaken. That's how it's called in English. And this has been done in the cultural context of uh, mixing paints. This is the work of one student. This uh, student uh, can operate with these things uh, and decide whether the color is going to be darker or lighter. So here we had additional modules for children. And now the question is about whether to study all those things in primary school. We can see that in high school this should be a tool for resolving more complex problems. So in the ninth grade uh, the whole chemistry Mendeleev table of elements should be a table of proportion of ratio with one mole. We should see those ratios in chemistry. And of course, many children have problems with uh, chemistry and physics in uh, high school. In the secondary school, fifth to seventh grade, uh, this is the time when you need to master this ratio. It exists in math. Uh, there are a lot of lessons dedicated to that, but it's uh, difficult. Many children have challenges. Uh, in the fifth, sixth, and seventh grade. But there are no problems in the elementary school because there are, there are no ratios there. There are just uh, formulas which are learned, and uh, the, usually this is problem number five in a test, the most uh, difficult problem in a in a test. Uh, so the question is uh, whether there should be some basic support uh, in the primary school so that when a child moves on to the secondary school, he has uh, some support, some uh, backbone to keep uh, studying ratios uh, in the secondary school. Because um, here the child needs to tackle a situation where there are two values. Uh, which are combined. And uh, 
So this is the fraction of whole or part whole ratio. And then the same ratio is something that he tries to do in chemistry. And this is a dead end. So our suggestion is uh, to use core measurement, which should be done in primary school. And I'm going to talk later about how to do this. Uh, so we can say that there is also this action of counting, which is done in elementary school. There is measuring. It's good that there is measuring and also core measuring. And we propose the special situation of two parameters that form a ratio. Both have to be taken into account. Here is a small illustration about the specifics of uh, the ratio and the proportion. Well, I will not speak more about this, but the previous logic is that we have the third value, such as the buoyancy of a vessel, for example, the shade of a paint, and to control this value children master an activity which includes two values and with this action they reconstruct the situation and understand how to work with the proportion and at the end of that they master a ratio between ratios that is uh, uh, how deep will an ice cube submerge if uh, uh, the water has some salt content in it. And in Davidov's book, we, and that's the book called Eight Specific Abilities of Knowledge Acquisition, there was this uh, topic uh, of uh, getting certain sets. Uh, so there is a ratio between various uh, values, uh, and uh, there was this diagnostic task, for example. For every house, you will need uh, this set of bricks, one large and three small bricks. And then you ask uh, the children. You need to arrange uh, given bricks and compare the groups. Uh, and uh, the children should actually get distracted from having those small bricks and then say that uh, Actually, there's the same number, so we need uh, to understand that A is equal to B here, that uh, the ratio is observed. Uh, here, there is the task of comparing groups of objects by the given criteria. And uh, when we build uh, everything here, there will be only uh, small elements, small bricks, but at the beginning, it seemed that there were more bricks, more small bricks. So this was written in Davidov's work, but uh, there was no continuation. And we believe that the continuation should be the action with two values. So in this elementary school, maybe we should put certain sets of things and compare them so that uh, when we move uh, to the shade of the color, when there are difficult sets, uh, complex sets, such as uh, four blue colors and five yellow colors, or three blue colors and four yellow colors, and compare which of them is going to be lighter, uh, whether it's going to be more yellow or more blue, the child should start working with those complex um, issues. And uh, we need to overcome a long path, uh, but we need to understand how to work with those sets. The child uh, should be able to work uh, in pairs, and that's uh, one more example with the colors. This is what we can do in primary school. Maybe this is just uh, the notion of integrity. We have um, houses that are all built in the same way so that uh, children understand uh, that there should be the same sets uh, of uh, some items and other items and so we've tested this approach 
and we've uh, tried doing this buoyancy task uh, in the primary school it didn't work and then we launched another study we had a classroom of uh, 20 ordinary children where there were nine boys and 11 girls uh, and uh, the only particular feature of this class is that uh, it's pretty small not 30 children but 20 and we started working with those sets and set making since uh, the first grade, since the very first form. And uh, we had comparisons, uh, we had uh, those uh, set making tasks. This study only started uh, and we can't yet see all the results, but we hope that it will make their life easier after that, when they start working with the third value. We hope that we'll see the result of our work, but for now we can say that it works. The criterion is simple. Either the children understand the curriculum or not. We could see that the children can't understand buoyancy. You can show them computer simulations, anything, you can paint anything you want, but they don't understand buoyancy. But in this case, uh, this method worked. Children did this, they discussed this, they were involved uh, in this topic. And this is a diagnostic task that the children didn't face. Mostly uh, they worked in pairs or individually and they set aside certain sets. And uh, this is continued action. It says that uh, a girl took some buttons to make six dolls, but she lost uh, some of the buttons. She lost some. She lost three blue buttons, seven green buttons. So how many dolls can she make now? My children haven't uh, worked with this problem yet. I will show you some other children who already tried this problem, but I try to speed things up. Uh, uh, those children work uh, on this martial problem, and also uh, they are trying to calculate and to count how many dolls uh, she can make. Well, how many, uh, well, sh they are trying to decide how many uh, blue buttons they need if they have 12 uh, blue blue buttons uh, and uh, the next task is similar so we will see how the children are tackling this task this is uh, accelerated uh, filming so they work in pairs one girl is responsible for green buttons the other one is responsible for blue buttons I'm not a teacher I just uh, diagnosed this uh, and my role was just to sit next to them, look at them and ask them tricky question. So the question is, once again, they have 12 uh, green buttons, uh, how many blue buttons they will need? Actually, these are ordinary children, ordinary first graders, they can hardly read actually. We didn't select them. Well, in this pair, uh, those two girls, they read slowly. So, five dolls, 15 green buttons. Can we have sound on? Okay, I'll... Okay, we'll do it without, uh, without the sound. Interesting that they start with six circles. Uh, she lost one, two. Uh, give uh, give Eve the chance to draw. She's got the blue color. Uh, put two buttons into each square. Yeah, no, it's not square. It's circle. Yeah, and then uh, you add green. Let's 
She lost one, two, three, four. How many? She lost. She lost three. Uh, read it. It's in there. She lost three blue ones. So she lost one here and here. One, two, three, seven, seven green ones. So she lost all these and one here. How many can she do? How many dolls can she make? Interesting that uh, uh, children used to be able um, to to use uh, the, the the previous drawing, but uh, she is re redrawing all the green ones, all the blue ones. So I'm not interfering here. If if they if they want to do it again, then they can do it. And it's a, a typical to refer to to text. Typical that they refer to text, uh, even if it's difficult for them. Yeah, and then, and then they got lost. Uh, they were seeing uh, it was about eleven buttons, but now they got nine. And here, in. So uh, they they did the reference uh, of a doll. Uh, point is that you don't need to interfere. Also about gestures. Uh, they um, uh, some uh, draw. Uh, five and five and five. Some start to say five and five and five. Um, so they condense. It's nice to watch the way they interact. And it's not important who's friends with who. So it's it's business, and it's not about uh, discussing who is uh, the leader. Give me the pencil. Now about the blue buttons. She'll, uh, she'll make five dolls. What they did uh, last time, they counted for me differently. No, but it's a single doll, right? What were they calculating then? What they were counting? They were counting buttons, not the dolls. Uh, they were cal uh, counting differently, uh, separately the head, separately the body. Yeah, we want to watch it till till the end. Oh, and this is just summary and single conclusion. That key criteria for us is to uh, just to continue. So we can state now that in the first grade we can do it. It's not uh, easy for them. They make a lot of mistakes. They have the decollage uh, phenomenon. On the one hand side, they count it as like this, but then they get uh, lost, and then the Davidov's uh, diagnostic uh, task also uh, also confused them. But it's again the zone of proximal development, and uh, they can tackle this task, and they have room for improvement and for developing. And there is also the idea that in the future it may have potential 
for uh, uh, in working with different subjects. So if we start uh, working with uh, two uh, values, then working with one one value. So if children can uh, are able to work with two values, then they will be able to work with one value, which according to curriculum is introduced at the end of the first grade. And working with, uh, well, work, and it uh, uh, combines well with working with measurements and parameters. Of course, the number of portions uh, it's not uh, here yet. Uh, and it's something f uh, for the futures when they split uh, into, uh, when they do group work like this. So uh, one is doing the portions and the other one is proceeding. And this is it. And uh, herewith I conclude. To invite a discussant for this, <coughs> for this presentation, Сейчас Людмила Георгиевна Петерсон, доктор педагогических наук. Людмила Георгиевна Петерсон, PhD and author of the activity method, author of the continuous mathematical course Learn to Learn for Preschoolers. Is author of the world of activities. Don't you want to join us for the discussion panel? Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Firstly, I want to thank the presenter for uh, bringing back to my youth. 40 years ago, in Russia, there was a discussion uh, going on in Russia about discovering the theoretical foundations for mathematics in order to correctly form the uh, mathematical notions in school children. And the focus uh, in there was on the key mathematical notions that are the foundation, namely relationship, uh, size, or uh, uh, set, number, etc. Different uh, groups were suggesting different kinds of approach. Uh, R&D institutions for the content and methods that included Pushkal, Neshkov, Konstantin, and uh, other uh, Methodology people they they suggested multiple approach to the theoreticians, laying um, to, I, I, in order to form the notions of proportion, not the mathematical notions. So they were offering uh, the notion of a set, and then starting from a set. After they were viewing uh, the relationship and then based on all that the notion of a novel was introduced and of course they were coming to measurement as an traditional mathematical approach but this genetic approach uh, that was presented was not used uh, in the, they used to g give uh, the children well he, this is a number See, there are three children, there are five children here, so this is a number, seven pens, and so on. So uh, they were generalizing what a number is themselves. But here, a problem was raised concerning how you uh, provide the theoretical foundation for a number notion. Gal Perrin's group use the foundation for this theory, a uh, notion of a measure, measure, relationship, number. This was the logic. Uh, Vasily Davidov's team said with measure, uh, a relationship measure and the number. 
Yes, no, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the measure was the basis of all, but that's the way I remember this. And what happened, Vasily uh, Davidov at some stage came to the conclusion that without the mathematicians, they cannot, uh, they cannot work without the mathematicians. So uh, Phil Lenkin was invited, uh, the leading uh, math methodologist in maths to work on a uh, systemic and genetic approach uh, for creating continuous mathematical education approach in uh, in the uh, primary and middle school how you uh, to in, to introduce the notions uh, to, to make sure that the key notions uh, like function and number are uh, formed properly. So uh, it was about the genesis of mathematical notions too. So I brought this quote from from those years. Patosky Mikhail was writing the following back then. True understanding of mathematical ideas is possible only based on the knowledge of their origin, on knowing the real sources that, as a result of obstruction, lead to mathematical theories, and vice versa. Without clarifying this, you cannot form a notion correctly. This is a genetic approach. Naomi Yakovlevich Vilenkin was talking about a uh, systemic genetic approach. So you don't have to uh, take separate notions, but you have to uh, consider the wholesome system of mathematical notions. What, what is this? For instance, when we are talking about the notion number, Digit, we need to understand that there are many aspects to it. So it's not only about measuring, but it's also about the order, about the quantity. Uh, there is an aspect of algorithm too, and all these aspects have to be there. Uh, to uh, be able uh, to transit to a real number notion. And such leading mathematicians as Kolmogorov and Gnedenka, uh, and, uh, Hans Freudenthal, they were also saying that the key importance is uh, the uh, sequential numbering. And sequential numbering leads to uh, the understanding of uh, uh, of uh, eternity or of infinite or infinity and uh, uh, mathematical induction and uh, axiom. So this sequential approach or, or sequential semantic of a number, uh, this has to do with different cultural uh, understandings of a number that has to be formed by children. So do you think that it hasn't been implemented? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to speed up. I'll try not to cover all kinds of approach. Yes. Um, every uh, every per person, uh, everything is, well, without commentaries, there is no, well, you know, I, I agree with you too. Uh, I'm saying that we, 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 we cannot teach uh, children to multiply one uh, second on by one third without this sequential understanding of a sequence. How, how, how you uh, do this? Yes, but, but these are different genetical conditions of uh, these notions origins. And there was a team, uh, we had our 
team that works on theoretical part, but I was working on methodology. So these connections that were devised in the course of analyzing those fundamental mathematical knowledge. Well, I was working on methods for uh, children. We were analyzing them and doing the calculation. So what you are doing uh, was what I was doing for six years in school number 91. So I was extremely uh, I extremely enjoyed watching uh, your presentation. So what we are talking about is that from a uh, didactical point of view, uh, every, every approach, uh, every approach of these four approaches uh, uh, has to be implemented. because everything is interconnected, so there should be a systemic approach there. So uh, what's now Milan can do? He developed a mathematical theory of a positive scalar value, where there is a certain set where a binary relationship is in place, uh, commut uh, commutative, is there and, and and so on and what and well he took the structure and was placing the structure in different introducing the structure into different conditions so uh, if a set is discrete then uh, a set of uh, natural numbers appears and when a set is a continuous set then, then continuity appears uh, uh, a set of uh, natural and real numbers. Well, I'm not a mathematician, I'm a methodologist, and I can either agree or disagree uh, here. But to me, uh, it looked very persuading, so I joined their experiment and uh, the such a theory was construed, which shows that nature of a number is dual. You take one cell. Uh, it won't be possible to take one cell and uh, grow everything out of a single cell. So the nature of a number is dual. And natural numbers uh, and discrete, and there is discreteness and there is continuity. So that's why uh, mathematical curriculum has to be based on the notion of a um, set and the size or measurement. And of course, uh, Vasily Davidov's uh, theory about children having to discover everything themselves. No, n not not on themselves, but to re uh, reproducing the cultural activity of a grown up. Yes, yes. But now, now we are talking that uh, they have to do it themselves. Well, I don't know whether we're simplifying, but we are using different tools now. Uh, to right now, we are using the theory that is written in the relative methodology and this is something that gives you new opportunities and for us this was a difficult path we didn't understand immediately that there is a huge breakthrough in describing this aspect and for us this is the activity method I'm trying to get back to the children's activities. So your conclusion was that there should be a system of preparing children to the notion of the number so that both two aspects are taken into account. Yes, uh, the aspect of set and value are taught in parallel and there are their properties uh, and analogies. Uh, and in both notions, the notion of the set and the notion of the value, they are all combined. 
Well, I wanted to ask you about children's activities, which coincide with the aspect of the number. We tell the children that there is the aspect of the set, and this set can be counted. There is the discretion property of the set. And if we talk about the uninterruptive aspect, it's about measuring. Well, measuring the values was uh, just taken from that work. I just wanted to uh, understand uh, your attitude to our suggestion that it's not enough to work with just one value and we should expand uh, the notion of measurement. It should be co-measurement of two values. So what's your take on it? You know, I believe that this is idea is interesting to me. I can't tell you immediately about my attitude. We need to look deeper into it. We need to think about it. But of course, that's an interesting idea. And this is the analogy between sets and values, the fact that, that this analogy works. Well, this fact is confirmed by the real practice. And our mathematics course is built on that. Our course covers a period from three years old to 15 years old. That is up to the ninth grade. And the Russian math team consists uh, by 83% of children who followed our program. I think it's a good indicator showing that our program is efficient. And that's not just a coincidence. It's not that this year it was that way and next year it will be that way. It's, it repeats from year to year, from 75% to more percent of children on the Russian national team are taught through our program. And our program covers from 5 to 10% of schools. You can imagine that. It's very good that you initiated this discussion, but we don't have much time. But let's move on to the next stage now. Thank you very much for this very interesting and intensive discussion. I would like to propose an overview of what I have seen. You have touched upon some very interesting topics, mathematical structures and their methodical transformation. It uh, was also a focus on the activities of a specific child. And I'm glad that we saw all the three pillars. And maybe one of you, or well, some of you will say that we don't need all three pillars, but those three pillars are what we actually do here. And my question concerns your last phrase. So I would like uh, to ask questions to Nastya and to you. But anyway, when we talk about mathematicians who develop programs, Yakov developed uh, a very mathematically saturated, very dense program who is, that is good for talented, gifted children. But when we try to prepare a course that everyone could understand, I could understand, this focus shifts. So what's the role of different disciplines at different levels of ability to mathematics? You know, according to our experience, we use the Zamkov school's achievements mostly. This school has the following principles. On the one hand, when I started working as a teacher, I really liked those principles. Because on the one hand, I am a university teacher. I thought I knew mathematics well. 
I could give a lot to my students. But on the other hand, I understand that in my class, I work to make sure that the children do not get bad marks, and I can't actually give everything I know to the children. They will not understand it. And those Zamkov's principles are formulated in such a way that it irritates people, even though they work very well. When I worked according to Zamkov's principles, I understood that uh, wicked children develop as they would in any environment. But I do not hinder the stronger children. I still work in the zone of proximal development of the stronger children. So right now my dream became a reality. Now we are talking about the minimax principle and the principle of the zone of um, proximal comfort. And this is the tool that we propose to the teacher so that this system really works. And I have a some experience uh, with a colleague, Ms. Mazurina. She called me and said, I have a very weak class with very weak children. Why are there so many weak children? We discussed those things with her and I asked her, how did they pass the exam? And she answered, they all got excellent marks. So you understand that when we work, uh, in the zone of proximal development of strong children. <clears throat> and at the same time, we think about uh, the degree of complexity, as Zamkov said. We create an environment where everyone develops according to their individual trajectory. It's good that we have this uh, dream coming true. Well, you know, teachers use this. It works. For your information, at our institute, there are about 600 experimental grounds all over Russia. We have two federal innovative uh, platforms, about 600 educational organizations. And these are really working tools, if the teacher is well prepared. Well. As a community of researchers, uh, we would be very grateful for the results that we could read. You know, throughout the year we have about 60 webinars where we explain problems and discuss results. We have problems with the methodology. We understand that we should uh, teach the teachers how to use those methodological tools. Otherwise, they will not make any progress. So, sometimes uh, this uh, teaching of uh, the stronger children is set aside and we try to drag forward the weaker children. So, what are the tools? I would now like uh, to um, look at this problem from a different view, from the aspect of the psychology, so that we keep our discussion in this balance. So, well, uh, as far as I understand, the question was uh, about the different levels of children at the beginning. So, how do you resolve this situation, this uh, problem? I think many people will hate me for this answer. But I will just say this. Ludmila talked about mass, and I thought, where are the children's activities? But here we have the notion of mathematical uh, mathematical notions. We want children to understand certain mathematical notions. What are the activities? There are no five di different scenarios. It's not that you will understand uh, the ratio in five different ways. No. There is just one approach. We just should not do it in such a way that the children will forget everything. 
We as psychologists should create a path for the children to go through. And this is the path we select for the children. So this path should be accomplishable for every child, regardless of his or her level. And this path will depend on the initial level of the child. So I believe that uh, in the primary school it's really difficult because there are children of really different levels. Uh, and the question is how all the children can work and make progress. So I don't like uh, the term of um, individual approach, but uh, sometimes there are different relatives because uh, there's the question of the child. It's, uh, there are children who have more mathematical abilities or fewer mathematical abilities, but, the, uh, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the children who are ready for something and who are not ready for something. And there's the same thing about ratios. If children can't do those sets in the primary school, it doesn't mean they will never understand ratio. I'm not saying that. They might understand this later, but the, th the important thing is that they all understand this at the end. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we did.